Tonight, um, I am delighted to be joined by um, two very knowledgeable speakers from Youth Eastside Services. Um, Youth, Youth Eastside Services is an incredible local organization that provides mental health counseling and substance use treatment to youth. And so I'd like to welcome um, Hannah Abata and Rowan Wakeley, who are behavioral and health support specialists um, with Youth Eastside Services. So welcome, um, Hannah and Rowan. Thanks for joining us today, and I'll let you get started. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us. Um, just looking in the chat, it looks like a lot of people have like some middle school aged kids, which is perfect because both Hannah and I um, specifically work with middle schoolers. Um, so let me pull up our presentation for you. And uh, like she said, we will do our best to like watch the chat, watch your Q&As, try and answer questions as we go, but we'll also try to save some time at the end to answer all your questions. Uh, here we go. If technology is nice <laughs> to me this evening. All right, perfect. So like we said, we will be chatting with you a little bit just about kind of like technology, um, some things that we feel like is important for parents to know around like safety, um, tips around how to use technology in a healthy way, because it is, as we probably kind of all noticed, it's not really going anywhere. Um, so we might as well learn how to live with it and how to live with it in a healthy way. And also just some tips about how to talk with your teenagers about it, because um, it can definitely be a point of contention, a lot of households. I know when I was a teenager, that was like the number one fight my mom and I got into is about my cell phone. Um, so hopefully we can help you guys learn a few new things and try some stuff out. Um, I was already shared a little bit about kind of like who we are and what we do. Um, but like I said, my name is Rowan. I work at Timberline Middle School and I will pass it over to Hannah. Hello everyone, my name is Hannah. I am the Behavioral Health Support Specialist and I work out of Kirkland Middle School. Um, we also work with the feeder elementary to our middle school, so we also have that age group. Um, so we're just kind of jump into our presentation and I really want to emphasize that this is just the tip of the iceberg for this conversation. Um, it's going to be very brief and we would hope that everyone kind of takes this information and is able to have um, healthy conversations with their teens and their students and kind of guide them in the right direction to make um, safe decisions on online. Like we said, it's not going anywhere. So we kind of just have to teach them the skills to exist safely on um, any one online platform. So the agenda for today is kind of knowing some of the risks and we're gonna give you some facts of what we've been seeing with teens and some trends. And we're going to be talking about healthy use of technology, so how um, kids can maximize their time on um, devices, whether it's laptops, cell phones, um, social media, anything they're using to connect with um, the bigger world. We're also going to be talking about tips to staying safe online, and these are um, we're talking more about um, parental control and other ways that kids or parents can. Um, work together to kind of keep the um, teams safe online. And another thing we're going to be talking about is how to start the conversation with teens. I know it's not um, a pleasant conversation for a lot of teens when um, there's a dis or a misunderstanding between parents and kids when it comes to devices and social media. So we're going to be giving you guys some tips on how to start the conversation. So let us jump to um, risks of technology. So some things we've been um, noticing in general is that, you know, comments or photos or anything an individual shares on any online platform is going to create a digital footprint of that person. And it's going to be easily accessible by anyone who is simply just searching their name, whether it's for um, college, employment, clubs, or anything like that. And it's really important that what we're putting online you know, is safe and is not um, derogatory or anything like that because it could come back later on and it could uh, prevent the child or the student from um, getting into different schools or getting employment. So one of the major challenges we're seeing with kids right now is nude photo sharing. 
Um, and a lot of times they do it kind of in an innocent way where they're calling it sexting and sending um, nude photos of each other back and forth. And that kind of falls under criminal law, which could be um, child pornography because the kids are minors at the end of the day. Um, another thing with nude photo sharing is they're being solicited on different um, social media platforms by predators. So that's also something that we're seeing and they're using it for um, blackmailing these um, minors. So definitely a concern. Another thing we've noticed is encouraging self-harm or suicidal information on some social media platforms. Um, if anybody was to go on TikTok or any social media and right now search for um, ways to end my life or uh, lethal ways to end one's life, there is information that is readily available and it could be due to um, lack of supervision or there isn't enough processing going on. So they have that information at the tip, the tip of their fingers. And something else that we are seeing is accidental um, fatalities due to uh, viral challenges. So for example, in 2020 and 2022, there were a few challenges that were coming out during COVID. And one of them was the uh, Benadryl challenge where kids were encouraging each other to take from like 12 to 14 doses at a time to start hallucinating. Unfortunately, because the dosage was so high, we um, saw a number of teens pass away from that. We've also seen the blackout challenge where they um, limit the air that goes into their brain and they pass out. And it was a viral um, challenge for a while. A few, teen, few teens ended up passing away. So we're seeing these accidental um, deaths from these viral challenges. Another thing that is challenging for teens is being bullied um, on online platforms due to their identity whether it's sexual orientation, gender, um, race, or religion, or just simple disagreements that they're having at school, um, it's really easy to get behind a computer and start targeting somebody on any social media platform. So that's something that's been very challenging with teens. And there are federal and state laws that can prevent um, some of these bullying. And for parents to do a little bit more research and kind of know what the laws are when it comes to these um, online platform bullying, because it's a little bit tricky when it comes to that. If the bullying didn't happen at school, sometimes st schools can't step in. So it's really important to know um, what the laws are around these um, online bullying activities for the specific states and um, places that we're living in. So another challenge is doxing or uh, cancel culture. And this can happen for several different re reasons. Um, they could get an argument and with different opinions and somebody gets canceled, which means um, their reputation is tarnished online and people start targeting them in real life where people are sharing their um, residential information or leaking their phone numbers. So it's kind of putting their safety at risk as well. And um, sexual exploitation and trafficking. Um, the law when it comes to social media is 13 and over and anyone who wants to join any sort of online platform, they have to be 13 and over. Unfortunately, because there isn't any um, solid age verification process for the social media platform, a lot of times predators are using these platforms to target minors and find information about these minors. And um, an article was sent to us yesterday actually, that uh, Meta, which is the parent company for Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger, is currently being sued for um, not having a sufficient um, age verification process, as well as releasing addictive features to kids that keep them engaged to these social media so they end up socially isolating and it's kind of tarnishing their mental health rather than do what it was meant to do, which is kind of create connectivity uh, between individuals. So again, sexual exploitation, social media platforms are the number one places where predators are going to find minors because it is super easy to get to them. Um, parents can control like what social media a kid joins by having them sign through their email. Unfortunately, that kid can still go and use that email and change the birth date 
to create a separate account to make themselves older on social media, which then gives them access to a lot of um, different features on those apps that are only accessible for um, people that are 18 and older. So that's definitely something to watch for. And then on the um, last kind of challenge we've been noticing is misinformation and more specifically with uh, medical advice. In the height of COVID, um, there was quite a few misinformations about um, the vaccine for COVID, how to make vaccines at home, um, how to make antibiotics, or even um, like safe abortions at home, which are all kind of misinformation that was gonna been given to people based off of their own beliefs and not through science and research. So definitely a, a lot of risks on social media for teens. All right, all of my Zoom things disappear on me all the times. So I never know where things have gone. Um, yeah, so obviously there are a lot of risks out there and it's really good to be aware of them um, as a parent and then also being able to like educate teens on it because a lot of times like teens, they're not thinking about all of those things. They're not really considering it um, because again, like you only, you only know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. Um, and we also kind of want to make sure, like, even though there are all of these risks, there are still like positive things about technology. Um, there's a reason we have it. There are really cool things to do about like with it. And it can be helpful in a lot of situations if you're using it appropriately and using it in a healthy way. Um, so some of the, the ways that we can use technology in a healthier way is being more like mindful and active when we're using it. Um, there's a lot of research out there about how just passively scrolling. So for example, if any of you have ever, if any of your teens have TikTok and you've ever seen them just kind of like mindlessly swiping up on their phone, usually that means they're just kind of passively watching things and not really thinking too hard about it. Um, and that algorithm is like kind of feeding into the videos that they're watching. So if they're watching a lot of videos about cats for example the algorithm will be like Ooh, okay we know this person likes cats here's 500 more cat videos for you to passively look at so that type of interaction with it is really not healthy it's not very helpful um so what alternatively is a lot more helpful is actively engaging with content you're interested in whether that's like an educational video um about I don't know, like a new uh thing in a different country or something like I've learned quite a bit on TikTok myself actually um so just being mindful of like not passively just scrolling through like actively trying to like learn something or do something with social media or maybe it's even something like you are finding videos intentionally with the purpose of like sending it to your friend because you want to have a conversation about it um another way to kind of like keep our technology habits healthy is monitoring our screen time so I know this is always a very big conversation with teenagers I I'm sure Hannah can agree, but I at least once a week have several kids in my office so upset because of their screen time limits. They're like, it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't fa isn't fair. I don't get it. Um, so it is a big topic. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to kind of have screen time conversations with your kids and how to set it. But really kind of what the recommendation is, is for teenagers, we generally don't want to have them on their phones or like doing not like school related stuff stuff like academic related stuff for more than about two hours a day. Um, obviously, it's going to vary a little bit from person to person. But in general, we can try and cap it about two hours for that recreational kind of like you're just sitting there watching TV or playing video games or on social media. Um, and then we also kind of want to know about limiting notifications. So again, too, like I get so many notifications all of the time, whether it's like Apple News or a Snapchat or a message or a random email or something, right? Like our phones are almost always going off. And with teenagers, we kind of see this like impulsivity type of thing. And even with adults, right? Like as soon as your phone goes off, you're gonna be like, oh, who was it? Like, what is that? I gotta know what that was. Um, so one way to kind of like deal with that is either you're putting your phone on like do not disturb mode. Um, so that way like no notifications are coming through or doing things like going through your specific apps and turning off the ones that you really don't need to be notified for. Like, for example, like on Instagram, you can change your notification so that you get a, like a pop-up on your screen every time someone likes or comments on it. 
in reality, you don't really need that information like right in that moment. It would be okay to just kind of turn that off for yourself and then kind of set a time of like, okay, it like every 30 minutes I will check my Instagram or something. So trying to like slowly reduce how much our phones are going off, how much we're paying attention to it. Um, and another really good way to increase our healthy habits is just taking a break, like get away from it. Um, obviously, the way you approach this conversation, you have to be kind of careful, right? Because a lot of teens will immediately go to this place like, oh, well, you're punishing me. You're taking away my things. But that's really not what it is. Everybody, adults included, we could all take a break from our screens, right? Whether it's like for work or leisure, most of us are staring at a screen for a pretty large chunk of our day. Um, so as a family, just agreeing like, okay, on like Friday afternoons, everyone puts their phone away and we just like don't look at it for the rest of the night or whatever. Um, so again, like taking that break, it can either be for like an hour, a day, a weekend, a week, really however long is tolerable, but trying to build that in is really important. Hey, um, just building off of that, we're going to be talking about some safety tips. Um, they're going to use their devices. They're going to be on social media. So just for parents, just being aware of what your kids are doing online. And um, Rowan is going to talk a little bit about it later, but this is going to go into that um, healthy conversation and having honest and open conversation with children. Then that way you can kind of get... Um, a little bit glimpse of what they're doing online and that way you can understand how to support them or um, if you need to step in and kind of do parental control by um, including softwares that's also something that's um, super important and another safety tip is just being aware of the number of digital platform um, a child has so research shows that you know the more digital platform that they're using the more opportunities for them to be exposed to potential safety concerns um, there's apps that don't even research or um, kind of watch what the user is doing in that moment for example um, websites like omegle where you can talk to somebody live and in these websites, people can ask and do anything and nobody is actually watching what's happening in the moment. So just kind of being aware of, okay, what platforms are you using? How many platforms are you using? What are those features? And kind of just learning those. Um, another safety tip, just like Rowan talked about a little bit earlier, is time spent on social media and just limiting the time with the like that matches the child's age obviously something a time limit that matches my age is probably not going to be fitted for somebody that's in middle school or even elementary school so just kind of matching their age um to however amount of time limit we're putting on their device or the social media or the app um another thing this is i think is super important is just learning what is being marketed to children and doing active research that way you're able to learn what are um, the important security features are the private the privacy laws and what kids are opting into when they're logging into these apps. I know nobody reads the privacy notifications that pop up when they're signing up for social media or when they're doing updates, but they're super important. For example, um, Snapchat recently did an update where you cannot sue them in a, um, like smaller courts and you have to kind of handle it with the company and a lot of people agreed to that without even reading it so now um, if you wanted to appeal it you only had 30 days after that update was in place and that time has passed so again very very important to keep track of what is being marketed to them how is it being marketed and what the safety features are, as well as the privacy um, features and the updates every time they're asking you to agree to any um, privacy terms. Another thing is learning about softwares that are available for parental control. Um, we can send this out later. There's a list of um, softwares that provide free um, control or assessment of different apps. Um, obviously, all features of those apps are not going to be available for free. They do have some features where you have to pay for, but there is a number of softwares that are out there that parents can put in place so that their child is not exposed to so many different um, safety concerns online. 
obviously, even when the child is being safe on their um, social media or device, there are going to be informations that are not filtered through correctly that kind of come on their pages. So they can accidentally be exposed to some of those safety concerns. Um, the last thing is just matching the software to the age of the child. This is just like matching the age to the time they spent on social media. So just knowing what the feature of the specific software you're wanting to use for your child's um, device or social media and learning what that's going to limit and what the device is being used for. Um, let's say they're using their laptop specifically for school. So you can block certain things that have absolutely nothing to do with school, um, vice versa with phones where they're just using you for social things. So just learning what they're using the device and what the software um, blocks or allows the child to do at the time. Yeah. I did. I noticed a question in the chat about kind of like controlling content on YouTube specifically and some softwares for it. Um, so like Hannah said, we can try and get you guys that like resource that just has like a, all of the softwares on it. There are a bunch of them. Um, and as far as YouTube specifically, I do know there's a, like a version of YouTube. It's like YouTube kids where it's supposed to be a little more filtered through. Um, and like you can put those parental restrictions on it and do all those things and unfortunately some kids will still choose to make different secret accounts um, that you may not know about as a parent um, so there are all these things you can do and I think a big part of it in like keeping your kids safe is like just having the conversation around it um, and learning how to like talk to them and like get on the same page with it so that you can get to a point where you can trust your child like on the internet and know that like okay like they aren't even they don't need these restrictions necessarily because I know they aren't engaging with that content and if they do engage with that content they know we can come and talk about it and have a conversation about it rather than now it's like you're in trouble and I'm taking it away from you type of thing um so like Hannah kind of mentioned like we want to learn how your teen is using technology whether that's having them like they themselves tell you about it of like, oh, hey, like how does YouTube work? Like, let me, show me a video. Like, how do we do this? Like, teach me how it works. Um, or potentially you yourself just downloading the apps and the things that you know your teen likes to use a lot and just mess around with it. See uh, see what that experience is like, see what you can learn about it. Um, Cause the more you have a better understanding of like how it's working, the easier it's gonna be to like have these conversations with your kids and know how to like help them stay safe. Um, and then also just doing like some research on your own of like, there's lots of websites out there um, that are like by parents for parents about like rating different things or like commenting on like how different apps and things work and like what to be aware of that kind of thing. Um, you also want to share the information that you have that they might not. Teenagers are very, very smart and they do sometimes have a tendency to think they know a little bit more than they do. Um, so sometimes you'll have information that they don't have, but while you're sharing that information, you want to make sure you're not giving them a lecture. Um, because I hear so often from my students that the moment they feel like their parent is just starting to talk at them, they have like zoned out, they're not listening anymore, and it's really not helpful. Um, so trying to ask questions rather than just being like, hey, here's this information usually goes a lot better. Um, so for example of like, hey, like I went to this webinar last night, I learned about blank. What do you know about that? Or like, did you know about this? Um, and creating it more of like a conversation rather than sitting them down and being like, here are these things I'm going to tell you. Um, just because that way they're much more willing to like listen to you and it is just way more effective. Um, and speaking of listening, as your kid is sharing out these different things, you're going to listen and validate their feelings because there are things they like about social media. There's a reason they're using it so much. Um, so kind of just asking questions are like, okay, like what, what do you like about it? Like what's enjoyable? Um, and then also like, what don't you like? Like what maybe doesn't work so well for you or what are parts of it that maybe don't make you feel so good? Um, and being able to just like provide a space without interrupting them, whether you agree or not with whatever it is that they're saying, um, just kind of listen to it and come from a place of like curiosity rather than judging the things that they're saying or the things they like or don't like about technology. Um, 
And then Hannah kind of briefly mentioned this, but a thing we see a lot is people just being not very nice to each other on the internet. Um, you feel a lot of people have a bit more confidence when they're sitting behind a screen and will say things that they would never say in person um, and don't always realize that the impact it's having is in real time. Like just because it is on the internet, it's still real. Like your online behavior is still impacting a real person and you're still a real person being impacted. Um, so it's like reinforcing like that general rule of kindness of just be nice to people. If you see something you don't agree with, simply scroll away from it. You don't need to get involved necessarily. Um, and just kind of encouraging them to think twice before responding or hitting send on something. And that's really just a good rule of thumb with anything, right? Like in um, like math class, for example, they learn you have to go back and double check your work. It's kind of the exact same thing when you're online. Just think twice about it, double check it, read through your message, be like, okay, like if this person was in front of me, would I really say this to them? And if the answer is no, you probably don't need to be sending it to them in a text either. Um, and then finally, as adults, you also just want to model appropriate social media and technology use. So like most adults are on our phones, whether it's social media or like emails even, or reading things on your phone, reading the news, like whatever it is you do on your phones is just modeling that behavior. So for example, if you decide as a family, we're going to detox, you need to make sure you are also detoxing from your phone and not using it. Um, and those kind of healthy habits we talked about earlier, like you want to make sure you're also following those. So then your teenager can be like, oh, well, like mom and dad do this too. So like, okay, like we're all kind of just in this together rather than them feeling like it's just me. Like I'm the one that has a problem. Because in reality, all of us to some degree have a little bit of a hard time with our technology use. Um, and then also I think just using it together can be helpful. So again, like outside of them, like teaching you how, the things work, like having, maybe they like find a TikTok they like and they share it with you and you guys can talk about it. Or maybe there's like a YouTube video and like a content creator your kid really, really likes and like watching a video together and just asking them questions about it. And just doing those things together um, can really help them feel a lot more like connected, like they can just have an open and honest conversation. Um, and I think a really big thing too is making sure they know that the consequence for coming and having these conversations with you is not that their phone will be taken away. It's just that we're gonna talk about it. Um, Cause I think for a lot of students that I see, especially that's like kind of a really big fear is like, oh, they're gonna take it from me. And then they don't wanna talk to their parents about anything that they're doing online, even if it is something that they would normally want to go share. Um, so making sure that they know that that's not gonna be what happens. Um, yeah, and I guess that is all we have. Um, so looking in the chat, I am hoping that your two questions about controlling it, YouTube and the parental control things have been answered other than what are some good sites because we didn't share that, but let me stop this. Yeah, if you guys have other questions or things that pop up or that you thought about, we would love to hear from you. Yes, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them in the chat or the Q&A right now. Um, and we can address them now. Um, okay. oh, that's definitely a concern of like using YouTube as a way to study and learn new things, but then also falling into that little rabbit hole. Um, yeah, YouTube is a really great study tool. There's so many really good videos on there that could help explain things in a way that just makes sense. Um, and again, because of like the algorithm, because of other things they may be interacting with, there will be fun little videos on the side of all of these other very unrelated things that look very tempting to go look at. Um, so I think one thing that definitely can be helpful is just like those general study tips of like, you know, focus on this for X amount of time, and then you're going to take a break and watch one of those like more less academic videos that you want to watch. And then you watch your video and 
helping your kid if they don't feel like they're quite ready to have the self-control to just stop it there and then watch like go back to their academic videos you're kind of checking in on them be like hey like your 10 minute break is up like what are you up to like what are we learning like okay that looks interesting that kind of thing can be helpful um I don't know, do you have any other thoughts on how to kind of reduce some of those distractions that can happen maybe just if you have the time kind of sitting next to them and supporting them to stay on task and just reminding them, be like, you know what, you can, you can do that once you're done with this task that you have in front of you. I know a lot of times they get distracted when they're alone. So just maybe if you have time to sit with them and support them as they're um, doing some of those activities on YouTube. Um, I saw a question in the chat and it says, how can you tell if a child has created a fake account? And unfortunately, unless they're using your email address where you're getting notifications that a new um, a new account has been created, there is no way of knowing unless you're using parental control softwares of like what activities my child is doing on the device. So again, it goes back to having those honest and open conversations with your teen and building that trust so that they are able to um, come and tell you like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Or if they are opening um, a new different account that you don't know about, you've already kind of given them those tools to make decisions online to stay safe. So even if they were to create an account you don't know about, just building that trust so you are in a place where you can trust them to make um, decisions online to stay safe. Um, the other question is, how can I receive the resources that you guys mentioned? And... Um, is there an email list? If not, like I was just going to ask people to put in their emails in the chat and that way we can just email it out. I'm not sure if there is a way yes. to do a general. Yes, we can definitely um, email resources to everyone that's registered for this parent chat. And we will do that within the week of this of today. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Another question about how the school district provides school laptops to all of our students and kind of restricting YouTube and things on there. Um, a lot of the school laptops will already just come with a lot of stuff restricted on it. I do believe YouTube is one of the things that isn't fully restricted on student laptops, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense in my brain, but I am not a district employee, so who's to say? Um, but I think with it being a district device, you can certainly talk to people within your school to kind of ask them about like what types of restrictions can be done on the school laptops. Um, and then in addition to that, again, some of those like um, different softwares that Hannah mentioned just to kind of check in on what's going on, um, like creating again that relationship with your student of like, hey, like your school laptop is for school. If you're watching YouTube for school purposes, like, okay, but if you're not, then you're not using that appropriately anymore. Um, and if they don't know, and this is not intended to be like a scare tactic necessarily, so definitely don't approach it that way. Um, you can also just share with them like, hey, like just so you know, if your school finds out that you're doing things on your school laptop that are not school related, like you're going to get in trouble because um, you sign it. All students at the very beginning of the year have a little paper that they all sign that says they're not going to do a non-school related things on their laptops. Um, so maybe just having that conversation too. And again, approaching it not as a like lecture type thing, just to like, hey, in case you didn't know this, just be aware of that. So you're careful on what you're doing with your school device. Yeah, it's, um, that's something that's definitely um, happening with my child too. Um, she actually goes to Kamaikin and she says that she's, you know, she has a lot of freedom over YouTube, I think, on the laptop. And I don't know that, I don't know the specific about it. I don't know, there is a lot that we as parents could do other than just understand more about why this is the case. I know that a lot of teachers do find YouTube to be um, an educational tool for their teaching as well. But, you know, um, I guess just personally, like, I, I wouldn't underestimate the power of um, natural consequences for your child too. You know, if they get caught up in watching YouTube, chances are they're not going to get their work done. And that's going to show in their work. It's going to show in assignments not being turned in. It's going to show in their grade. And sometimes, I mean, not just kids, but we all need um, to learn from 
uh, a natural consequence, you know, and um, that can be a powerful lesson. Um, just to build off of on what Rowan said, and again, this is not a scare tactic, but whatever students are sharing through their district laptops, district can see. Um, so just informing them that if they think they can bully people and think it's going to be anonymous, it's going to come back on them because district knows who those laptops were checked out to. So just informing them to really be safe and like, if you're not going to say this to somebody in person, don't use um, social media or um, devices to do it, and especially not one that is checked out to you through um, district because it's super easy to find out who did it. Um, somebody just asked a question and said, do kids have similar education at school too? This is a new topic we've been working on since summer. It was brought up at the end of last school year. So we are working on a bigger project and this is a continued psychoeducation we're giving to um, not only parents, but students as well as our own staff because this is something that we're also learning as it's happening. It's changing every day. So we're trying to learn as much as we can so that we can um, educate kids at school, our staff, parents, basically anybody that is involved um, with children. Um, for the last question, I did have a thought about using the school laptops. I don't know if you also see this hand or if other people see it, but I have a lot of my students who talk to their friends via mm -hmm. their laptops and their school emails, um, especially those who don't have cell phones or their friends don't have cell phones. Um, and I'm always a little bit shocked at how shocked they are when I tell them that the school can pull all of those emails and read them if they'd like to. So they're like, what? Like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, when you yeah. have private conversations on things that are owned by your school, of course, that's not going to go very well. Um, so again, I think that just goes to show like a lot of students just don't know these things. Um, and then once they do learn them, they're much more willing to like make different choices. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a question around giving freedom to high schoolers it I feel like every therapist and mental health counselor's favorite answer is it depends um so it depends um a lot on your high schooler I'm a firm believer and I don't think that age necessarily equals maturity um I don't always like I hear a lot of students like oh well my mom said when I'm 16 years old I can have a cell phone and it's like okay and if you are not mature enough at 16 years old to handle having a cell phone, you probably shouldn't have one yet. Um, in the same way that maybe a 14 year old is mature enough to handle having a cell phone and can like follow all those safety tips and is willing to have conversations with you. Um, so I think it really just depends on like how much your high schooler is willing to like have open and honest conversations with you, um, be willing to follow kind of some healthy habits and safety tips, be knowledgeable enough to keep themselves safe with the freedom that they're given. Um, and then also trust you enough where if they are using their freedom and then something bad happens, that they can come and talk to you about it without getting in trouble for it. And knowing that doesn't necessarily mean their freedom's being taken away. It just means you might have to put a few restrictions on it for a little bit to help them figure out how they can have that freedom and keep themselves and the people around them safe and happy and healthy. Yes, that is very true. Um, the chat says, trying to keep reminding them that everything is online, is not private, even text messages. This is very correct. So again, constantly telling them, if you're not gonna do it in person, don't do it through text, don't do it via email. It's still part of real life just because it's virtual doesn't make it not real. So definitely not private. Um. <laughs> yeah, even um, I know I hear from a lot of my students kind of the misconception that like their Snapchats are more private because they the way snapchat kind of works is you'll send one it lasts for like now they have a feature we can like put it for like infinity seconds but usually just a few seconds or like a picture and then it just kind of disappears so most students like oh well i don't see it so it must be gone it is not gone mm -hmm. it still exists 
Um, so I've noticed, especially like a lot of my students will send more unsafe and unsavory things via Snapchat. Cause they're like, oh, well, like it disappears and it's not on my phone. Like my mom can't see it. Like we're fine. It does not go anywhere. It is still there. It is still very much in their system. Um, so I think again, like sometimes teens do take many reminders. Um, sometimes they forget, sometimes they forgot to listen when you were telling them the first reminder and you just got to do it a few times. Um, but I think yeah, just consistently being like, hey, just remember that exists. It didn't go anywhere. Like it can still be found pretty easily. Just something to add on Snapchat. Um, it's happened in several different middle schools. So it's maybe something to bring up in a conversation with your child. They do have these big group wide or school wide group chats where they're conversing with people they don't even know at school and a lot of things get said there. Um, none of it has been positive so far. Um, a lot of the times it's bullying, um, which translates into school. And then they end up getting, whether it's in physical altercation, arguments or whatever it may be. So just keeping an eye on Snapchat, it's a really um, interesting platform, just like Roman said, they think it disappears. So they're sending a lot of these hurtful and um, unnecessary things via Snapchat. So definitely have a conversation with your kiddo about um, what they're doing on Snapchat and these bigger um, group chats that are school-wide. Yeah, definitely a takeaway is if you can't say it in person, don't send it. Um, <laughs> and even in the outside of like saying like unkind things, even I have students that want to have like pretty like pretty deep conversations like with their friends or maybe they've gotten into a fight with their friend and they're trying to apologize and they want to do it over text even with those things I have conversations with them all the time of like okay like why can't you say this in person like why are you choosing to do it this way um and trying to unpack that and help them understand that like face-to-face -face communication is still very important especially with relationships you care about and you want to maintain and nurture um, and I think for a lot of students and the COVID certainly didn't help, but I think they've gotten, they're getting better, but at least in my school, a lot of them are really bad at talking to each other in person. Um, I mean, again, part of that is COVID. They weren't really allowed to talk to each other in person for quite a while. Um, so even just helping them like learn that skill of like, don't hide behind your phone and your text, like just go tell them this thing in person. Because um, it's a really helpful skill in life. Because if you ever, I don't know, like have a conflict with your boss, let's say, you usually can't really just text them and be like, hey, like, I'm mad at you. Like, that's usually a conversation you have to have in person. Um, so just helping them learn that skill is helpful. I've got a question about um, my 12 year old who has asked about joining Discord. I don't know if you've heard of much about Discord, um, what you can tell me about it. Um, but it seems like a lot of the kids that are at that age that do not have a personal phone yet um, are looking for a different way to be able to text um, and converse with their friends online. And Discord is one of the popular ones. Uh, I know. I don't. Do you know things about Discord? I I am not versed in Discord. I know what it is. I don't know information about it. Okay, I know a little bit. Um, so essentially Discord is another platform that people can use to like chat with other people. Um, usually most people, like most teens I know that use it will create like groups with just their friends. Um, and then just like any other platform where you can message back and forth, you can like instant message people, send pictures and videos, that kind of thing. Um, Discord is especially popular with people who play video games. Um, and usually people have their, they call it like their Discord chat. And it's like the group of people they like play video games with and they'll interact in that way. Um, and then I do believe though, you are able to like join Discord channels because like you join a channel and then you're just kind of in there. Um, and you can do that with just random people you don't know about. Um, it's designed to have kind of some community you're talking about a very similar thing. And of course, things don't always go how they are designed to go. Um, but as far as like how exactly it like interfaces and how it works, I myself have only really used it once and it didn't make any sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not 100% sure, but. Sounds like I need to do some research on my own too. As um, a parent, that's my responsibility. <laughs> um, Thank you. 
I want to address, there was a chat that popped up about um, ESL parents and kiddos just saying it's okay with friends. I'm definitely getting community support. I know there are definitely communities um, just, and then like doing online research, there are definitely a lot of resources available in different languages for um, different social media platforms, different devices. So really doing a lot of research helps. I'm not sure. Um, Sorry, it, it went away. I was reading the chat and it popped up, but I'm not exactly sure um, the actual sites for them, but I am very aware that there are sites that some of my parents have gone to do research for themselves to kind of learn certain things in their own language so that when their kids are like, oh no, it's okay. Or like, oh, you're not understanding what I'm saying. So like you do have understanding of what the social media features are or what the apps are for. Um, let's see. Yes, they are conversing through Roblox. I've heard that a few times in session. Um, how to deal when your kids get cyberbullied. Okay, so for the cyberbullying, I kind of briefly mentioned it earlier, but there are state and federal laws that um, address cyberbullying. It is definitely criminal activity. It, it falls under harassment and targeting and bullying. So just do a research of the Washington state law. And then according to whatever the bullying is, because there's so many different breakdowns for cyberbullying. So whatever type of cyberbullying is happening, kind of follow that and report it to law enforcement. Even if you're not sure if it's reportable, um, calling law enforcement is a great place to start. They will kind of inform you what the best solutions are because it is situational and it depends on what exactly is happening. So definitely calling law enforcement. Um, somebody shared a resource about Discord, so thank you. And then uh, to with like students I've worked with around cyberbullying, like one thing we've uh, kind of found pretty helpful is again like limiting their notifications or blocking people, because um, it is I. I see a lot of my students, they really want to know what people are saying about them, even when it's bad. Um, so just having conversations around like, why does this matter to you? Like, is this really helping you? Um, and getting them to a place where it's like, you know, if someone is doing these things to you, like in addition to reporting stuff is like, let's just block it, turn it off, like don't look at it. Um, and then also kind of helping it really with any bullying situation, right? Is usually the person doing the bullying is the one that's got something going on more so than the person being bullied um, and helping students learn like, hey, like, yes, they are saying these things about you. And like, are we really sure those things are actually true? Or is this person just maybe a mean person that's saying mean things for whatever reason they're being mean? And that's not really your problem. Like, let them be mean. Don't kind of give it any, don't pay attention to it. Um, focus on, you know, like the positive, like your friends, your family, like the people that make you feel good. Um, and just trying to take that approach of just like, especially online, just like, don't look at it, don't interact with it, just turn it off. If you're going to be too tempted to check it, even going as far as deleting the app that you're being bullied on, like just get yourself away from it. Um, cause I know a lot of my students will go back and like read it over and over and over and over again. And it just like reinforces this message of all these negative things people are saying about them. Um, so just getting them to get away from it. I've found it's been pretty helpful. Um, there was a question about joining the school-wide group chat on Snapchat, and unfortunately, it does show who the user is, and you do have to request to join, and I'm not aware of who creates these pages or who is the um, admin of the group, so they do have to allow you to get into the, the, um, the chat, so I don't think there is a way to maneuver around that, but just having that open conversation of, like, what are you guys talking about in there? Are there safety concerns? Are you responding back? So just, again, having that open conversation is super helpful when it comes to this because there is no way to get into these group chats without being approved by one of um, the members, which are the admins or the ones that create the groups. Okay. I think that's... It in terms of questions, we've had a lot of questions, um, all really great ones. Um, and 
I want to thank our speakers, um, Hannah and Rowan, for sharing your knowledge and experience um, advice with us tonight. Um, everybody, let's show them some appreciation and give them a virtual hand clap or other reaction of your choice. Thanks for having us. Uh, thank you. Hand claps. Um, look, I cannot uh, wait to apply some of these recommendations with my teen and myself as well. Um, I actually um, did turn off my app notifications um, on my phone a couple of years ago. It's just made a world of a difference um, with me not continuing to like check my phone and grab my phone whenever I hear a little ping or I see something come up on the screen. So that's that's been um, amazing for my family. Um, so um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, our next parent chat webinar will be on sleep hygiene, helping your child develop good sleep habits, which also would have um, a positive impact on their mental health. So um, don't miss out on that. Thank you everyone and have a good night. <laughs>